Okay, so this week we're going to look at risk assessment as well as hazardous waste. There is a section on the text in the textbook, sorry, rather for this. So please make sure you also read the pages as we give at the end of these slides. What we want to look at in the objectives for this week is just to introduce the basic, it's the very basic concept of risk assessments. So we're not going into any detail. This can be an entire course. Risk can be an entire course on its own. We want to just look at a little bit about risk perception. These two here, when we talk about risk, it's going to be environmental risk. So we're going to look at chemicals, the risk of chemicals to the environment. When you ask your friends what risk is, there's going to be all sorts of different thoughts on what risk is. The basic definition stays the same, but we are not looking in this course about financial risk and things that your commerce friends will be looking at. And we are not really going to spend much time on occupational health and safety, but there is, as I say, a whole section on occupational health and safety, process safety, risk, and all of that as well. We will touch a little bit on that, but not much. So as I say, this risk that we're looking at today is environmental risk. We also want to have a, just a brief look at what sort of hazards, hazard identification type things are, human exposure assessment. And then we're actually going to start on this last one to just look at what some hazardous types of waste or what types of hazardous wastes we might come across. So coming back to something we've seen before, the waste hierarchy, the most favorable one is at the top. We have the favorable option of prevention, minimization, reuse, recycling, energy recovery and disposal. So this is the, the 3R or the 4R type model, or now more commonly the circular economy, so that we can get the prevention and not have disposal. However, when we have disposal, some of that waste might be hazardous. And hazardous to you and hazardous to me is possibly going to be different. And it's also going to be different between different groupings. So the US EPA is the United States Environmental protection agency, they say that hazardous waste is a waste with properties that make it dangerous or potentially harmful to human health or the environment. So it's basically just a dangerous waste and danger to human health or the environment. They can be solids, liquids, or contained in glass or sludges. And I'm not quite sure why it's not here. I don't see a reason why it can't be gases as well. WHO, that's the World Health Organization, is a waste that has the potential even at low concentrations. So this is important here. It's at low concentrations as well. It can also have adverse effect on public health and the environment. So different wording, but it's basically the same definition. In South Africa, we have the SA Waste Management Act, where hazardous waste here means any waste that may, by either a circumstance or use, so even though this is nowhere near people, it could be far away, it's just because of what it is, also because of the quantity or the concentration, something, 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 has significant diverse effect on the health and the environment. So all three, the wording is different, but they all say it has some dangerous or potentially harmful effect to humans and the environment. Where can we get hazardous waste? So now anything that is dangerous is hazardous waste, as from we had, what we had from the last slide. So a common Hazardous wastes are going to be from the mining and the metallurgical fields, obviously from waste. So there might be arsenic. Some examples here are arsenic from the gold recovery process from some of the mining things. Industrial wastes, chemical industry, motor manufacturing, tanning can all have industrial wastes, particularly water pollution that come out that are hazardous. These could include the benzenes, toluenes, things like that, or other chemicals that could just be potentially dangerous to the environment. Third one, radioactive waste. Anything that has any radio radiation is going to be classified as hazardous waste. And the last one is not to forget is any healthcare waste. So anything that could be a drug. So when we talk about drugs, we're talking about both the, the bad drugs and the good drugs that will help us. Any sort of pharmaceutical companies that are making your medicines, your drugs, your pills, any of that waste that goes out into the environment is also classified as hazardous waste. If we just look at quick nuclear waste, I'm not sure there's actually anything that I want to go through specifically on this one with you. You can have a look and stop this now and just read through this, please. Thanks. Okay, so typically these are 10 hectares with an overall depth of 10 meters or more. They may be above the ground or, or partly above the ground or they might be partially below the ground, depending on the, the area of it. The one in South Africa that you may know of is the Hall Fontaine one that is closest to Johannesburg. 
what do we classify the hazardous waste as? So this is one of the examples. This is the most common example of hazardous classification. From some of my research in setting these up now, there is there are certain groups who classify it slightly differently. We call it we're calling it classes here. There are others that call it divisions, but you'll see the numbering is typically the same up to class nine. So you'll see as well, if you're looking at last year's notes, there's also up to class nine. There is an international act um, which tries to unify all of these, and I'm not quite, I can't quite figure out how far they are in unifying it. From what I can see, this is the international, is currently the internationally accepted um, dangerous goods classification system. So if this is the dangerous goods, this is effectively the hazardous waste. So hazardous waste classification starts at number one. So anything that is explosive is going to be classified as hazardous and dangerous. Type two is gases. So 2.1 is a flammable gas. 2.2 is a non-flammable, non-toxic gas. Whereas three is a toxic gas. Sorry, there should be a code on there. So is three is a toxic gas. Class three is a flammable liquid. Four is now solids. So you can either have a flammable solid spontaneously combustible solids or solids that are dangerous when wet. So we can also have in section four, you'll see there's the fire symbol for flammable and then there are different classes for this. Five is oxidizing substances or organic peroxides. Six is the toxins. Seven is radioactive, which we've already mentioned. Eight is corrosive. So that can also be a hazardous substance, which we haven't mentioned so far. And section nine is Miscellaneous. So anything that doesn't fall under everything above is going to be given the other terminology. The example here we can see is asbestos. So in terms of this as well, we also get packaging groups. So there's packaging group one, two, and three, where packaging group one is the most danger, whereas packaging group three is the least danger within these goods classifications as we've got in this diagram. Risk. So now we're going to start on what exactly is risk. So you're going to hear a lot that risk, there is a potential for risk in almost anything that we do in our daily lives. And the same is true for environmental engineering. Almost everything has the potential to be a risky occurrence. The thing now to note though, is that the definition of risk is the probable occurrence of an adverse effect. So that is something happening, something bad, the adverse effect is something bad happening, or a threat to a person or to the environment but it also includes the probability of that thing happening. So this man walking on a tightrope, if he falls off, what is the consequence? So the consequence of him falling off, this depends on how high he is above the ground. So he might be very low from the ground, so the consequence is going to be nothing. He loses his balance and he just the floor might be as low as his PowerPoint slide. So there is no consequence to him falling off. If he was 10 meters above the ground, the consequence might be a broken leg. If he's 100 meters off the ground, it's going to be death. So the consequence is what would happen on this happening. The probability is going to depend on how good is he at, a tight, at tightrope walking. If, he does, if he's never done this in his life, the probability is high that he will fall. If he's a trained professional, the probability is low. So the probability, how good is he versus what are the consequences, if we multiply those two together, that is the definition of risk. So a high probability of something going wrong, a high consequence of something detrimental or adverse happening will be a high risk scenario. What exactly is high and what is low then all depends on how you want to define high and low. So acceptable risk might be one to one million. So the probability of something happening is 10 to the negative six. That would be as the example here of developing cancer in your lifetime. So the chances of you developing cancer in your lifetime, according to the statistics, are 10 to the negative six. So that is possibly, is that a acceptable risk or is this not an acceptable risk? In the same way, we could calculate the risk. So in a previous lifetime, this was my day-to-day -day job, I would calculate the risk of if a tanker, so a engine BP tanker that comes to the local petrol station, if that had to ignite, what is the chance of somebody at that petrol station getting burned, getting killed? Or what is the probability of that petrol state, or sorry, of that tanker actually igniting in the first place? So it's a complicated calculation of the probability of the tanker leaking, the probability of that igniting, the probability of somebody being close by, multiplied by the consequence of what would happen. Would that be somebody that is dying? Would it be somebody who just gets burnt? So that probability, if that had to come in at 10 to the negative five, so that would be more dangerous than cancer. If it was 10 to the negative 12, 10 to the negative 15, 
is that an acceptable risk when compared to something like cancer, which is 10 to the negative 6? Okay. Is 10 to the 6, is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 12 acceptable for a risk of ignition at a petrol station? This all depends on what that consequence is, if it's going to be death or minor burns, as well as the regular or the, not the regulation, yeah, I suppose is the regulations, the law of the, the area at the time that this was done. Okay. It's also a function, so risk, the last point here, is also a function of the hazard posed by the activity. Yeah, I suppose I've actually discussed that already. Okay, so that was risk. So when we talk about risk in the context today, we're going to be concentrating more on the possibility of wastes. So these are the toxic or the hazardous wastes that we might be letting off from our sites or letting out. How do these wastes affect the human health or the environment? So the severity of this impact is obviously going to depend on the characteristics of the waste. So how dangerous is the waste? And that will also indicate how risky it is or the severity of the risk. It also comes down to the vulnerability of those exposed to these situations. So if you are going to dump, or we're, not, we're never going to dump, but if your toxic waste had to spill into a dry desert area, or if it's going to spill into some na nature reserve or some pristine feinbos, what is the vulnerability of those that are exposed to situations? This also means what sort of people are it, is it exposed to? Is it exposing children or is it exposing it to healthy, fit adults? Okay, so we're also going to look at the pathways of transportation and what sort of exposure this leads to in a few slides to come. What we are going to have now, though, is three terms which we need to just identify before we move on. The first one is LD, which is going to be the lethal dose. What sort of dose or how much do you need to give to a person before they are going to die? So that's the lethal dose. Another term, and we're jumping to the bottom one here, is the lethal dose 50, so the LD50. And I've written it here as a subscript, but often it's written as subscript. I've also seen it written as just LD50 all in the same line. I've written it as both in these slides. The LD50 is the lethal do dose that would cause at least, well, not at least, that will cause exactly 50% mortality. So if you had to give this dose to the entire population, 50% of the population of whatever you're giving them to would die. Okay, so that's the lethal dose. In a similar way, we can also have the LC. So that's the lethal concentration, which would cause 50% mortality. So the lethal concentration is often something like for fish, and we'll see that again in the slides that are coming up. If you had to add some toxin to the water, what is the concentration that you would have in the water that would lead to 50% of the, for example, the fish dying. The dose is typically something that you would administer to, or that a person would have to ingest, or something that would be sort of medicinal, or that nature. So, unfortunately, as I said before, there's always risk involved. So there's risk associated with everything. So there's a certain level due to, and here are the silly examples of eating, driving, even standing outside in our homes. So you're never safe just standing outside in your homes because there is a chance that lightning will strike you and you will die. As we say, the, the prob probability of this is going to be extremely, extremely low. The consequence is, however, on some of these things is high. So if you're in a car accident, you might die. That What are the chances of you dying in a car crash? So it's one in a million, a billion, a trillion. I don't know the numbers for driving. Okay, But there's always going to be a level of some risk. The problem, however, is that even the individuals that do not engage in a habit can be at risk. So even though you're trying to be safe and avoiding risk, you may be exposed to certain things anyway. So some of the examples here are smokers. So the stats, according to the study that I read for this one, is that stats, sorry, smokers will shorten their lives by five minutes for every cigarette that they smoked. That's on average across their lifetime across the entire world. Non-smokers, however, are also at risk because of the secondhand smoke from those that are around them. It's almost impossible to avoid secondhand smoke. It's something that you are going to come into contact with at some point in your life. So the same thing is going to be true where it's not your fault that Sassel is polluting, that we're well, not Sassel, Sassel engine, everyone is polluting to some degree. We are now the non-smokers that are getting the secondhand smoke, the secondhand air pollution from all, not just the ones I've mentioned, all of the industrial activities that are out there. As engineers, we should be looking to reduce the pollution from the facilities where we're working so that we can help reduce the risk for those that aren't on our sites.
So just to give you some example of the annual risks, so these are so risks of death associated with certain activities. So as we say, this is the annual deaths per 100,000 persons. So if you're 100,000 persons, the chance of you dying in a motorcycle accident, there are 2,000 out of 100,000. Smoking is 300 from cancer only is 120. So these are fairly high numbers. Okay, so how do we avoid dying from these things? Don't go on a motorcycle, don't smoke. So those are easy ones that we could potentially avoid. As I say, everything has risk to it, and the statisticians out there have done numbers on silly things like eating four tablespoons of peanut butter per day. I'm not quite sure why you would die from that if it's high cholesterol oils or something like that in it. There is a chance of you dying from eating too much peanut butter. There's also a chance of you dying from just drinking water. I'm not quite sure if that's drowning or from the chlorine in the water, or even from just eating steak a day. Okay. I haven't done the maths on what three ounces is in terms of grams so that we can get a better understanding of those numbers. So when we're looking at environmental risk assessment now, we are going to be exposed to various other things that could cause cancer, reproductive failure, neurological damage, developmental problems, or birth. Sorry, birth deformities. So these are the types of things that could happen in the environment. Um, due to our activities as engineers that we could now try to avoid. When we are looking at the risk assessment or when we are trying to do a risk assessment for our activities, it's typically broken down into four different steps. The first one is hazard identification. What exactly is the hazard? So you'll see in this slide that we're typically looking at things like what is the chemical, um, what is it, benzene, chlorine, what sort of gas is it? That's the risk identification that we are talking about here. You can also do a risk assessment for hazard identification in terms of what happens if the thing should blow, if your chemical site, what would happen if your chemical site blows up? What happens if there's a leak, a pressure gets too high, what happens if there's a fire? So risk identification is not just what chemical will lead to some form of cancer or these types of things that we've listed up here. It's much, much broader than that. In terms of cancer, reproductive failure, and neurological damage, so that's the environmental risk assessment, not the process risk assessment. You would then look at what a dose response assessment looks like, what is the exposure assessment, and then risk characterization. So these are the four steps that are typically in all risk assessment studies when you're looking at environmental risk. Okay, so let me just say that again, risk is much broader than what we're looking at today. So there is process safety risk, there's financial risk, there's all sorts of other risk. Hazard identification would form part of all of those types of risks. These next three steps are mostly for environmental risk assessment, which we are doing today. Okay, so just looking at these with some of the details into them. So hazard identification, as I said, is what are the health problems caused by the pollution? What is the, can we identify the hazard? Dose response assessment is what, what sort of health problems would occur at different doses. So are you going to have mild problems, bigger problems at different exposure levels? The assessment, the exposure assessment, how much of the pollutant do people inhale during a specific time period? So are you releasing a chemical from your plant for 30 seconds or are you releasing it for 30 years? How many people are exposed? So are you, is that if it's a gaseous emission, does that gas go over the wall to three houses or does it go over the wall to three, three towns across the way? The next thing is the risk, the last thing rather, is the risk characterization. What is the ex extra risk of health problems in the exposed population? So yes, you might have something dangerous going over your wall, but is it actually contributing more than just the, the average exposure in the area? How much, are you, how much can you reduce the pollutant on your side so that you can reduce the risk in the overall population next to you as you've calculated for the previous steps? So the procedure for this, as we've already said, are going to follow these three steps. The identification, can we determine whether or not a particular chemical is causing or is this three is casually linked to a particular health effect, such as cancer or birth effects? Is it true that chemical A actually does lead to something versus chemical B, or is it actually safe for the environment? The dose response assessment is going to be the process of characterizing the relationship between the dose of an agent, sorry, the second should but I shouldn't be on a new line, and the incidence of an adverse health effect. Okay, so the various, sorry, I see there are a couple of lines here that shouldn't be, be on that second line there. Exposure assessment is going to involve determining the size and the nature of the 
population that has been exposed to the toxicant. And finally, the risk characterization, as we said already, is integrating all the steps to decide the, sorry, sorry, uh, the risk characterization is the integration of all the above steps to result in the definition and estimate of the possible health problem. So what is this extent of the health problem by risk characterization? Okay, so these slides now are getting a little bit repetitive, so I'm going to ask you to both read through these next ones as I skip through them and also just check in the textbook, please. So as we said, there's hazard identification. We also want to know what is the toxicity of the chemicals. So the toxicity is going to be the amount required to kill an organism. So unfortunately, death is the thing that we measure a lot of things in for this risk assessment. It is sometimes obviously going to be people. So how much is going to be required to kill a person or a mouse or a fish or something like that? Okay. The toxicity is the requ amount required to kill an organism, but it might not to kill a person. It can also have other effects. Ingestion, so that's taking it in through the mouth, of low concentrations often has or usually has a greater consequence for children. That is simply because children are smaller, there's less body weight to them. So for every kilogram or every gram rather of toxin, toxicant that they ingest, they are going to have less body weight that is going to absorb it. It's also true that not everyone will react the same way to the same amount of toxins. Some people react differently and their bodies might expel it faster than other people, but it's not always the case. Toxicity is also expressed either in short term, so it's either acute, what will happen to me immediately, or as well as long term effects. So the short term, if I had to ingest something now, will I get sick in the next 20 minutes? Or the long term effects, if I have exposure to some sort of chemical, is there going to be an effect 20, 30, 40 years down the line? Okay, this long term effect can also lead to mutagenesis. So this is a mutation of your body, the cells, the DNA, and this often takes a long time to develop. So this is what happens, sorry, when this happens rather, the chemicals can cause either cancer, so the cancer causing carcinogenic type effects, there could be birth defects or reproductive failures, and these are often due to the chemicals which are able to alter DNA. So when they alter DNA, they cause the cells to malfunction, they can, as we say, lead to death or abnormal offspring, or other genetic disorders. So carcinogenesis, this is if something is cancer causing. So if it's cancer causing, we refer to it as a carcinogen. So carcinogenesis is this process. So this is a chemically induced process that is thought to produce to proceed in two stages. So there's the initiation and the promotion. So once you have the chemicals in your system, the initiation is when the mutation occurs at the original cell, so that the cell's genetic material is altered in an original way um, that may or may not result in an uncontrolled cell manipulation. So it's just the alteration of a single, well, not a single, in the few cells. The second stage in this is the promotion. So cells are now have now been altered, and now they no longer recognize growth constraints. So they simply just carry on growing. So they either grow in a natural way or an unnatural way, mutate in some form, and they grow, sorry, lead to tumors. If this tumor then goes under metastasis, it's said to be malignant. So that metastasis, it can have a different form than the original form of the cell that is now malignant, and it can break into other areas of the body. So once it's broken into different areas of the body, it's difficult sometimes impossible to remove or treat. So if your malignant tumors start in one area of the body, say your stomach, and then they sort of start growing outside of your stomach, that's when they are said, often said to be malignant. It's broken through other areas of the body. So here we just show this graphically. So you see there's the initiation of a single cell, a genetic change, which then manipulates several cells. We can now see that inside here, there's a different genetic makeup. There's a different size or a different type of little darker dot in the middle that now becomes a malignant cell that changed cell now grows rapidly or grows sorry unconstrained growth and now we have multiple of these cells that have now mutated through the genetic change so we have the progression of this carcinogenesis or this cancer that is now forming 
Toxicity of chemicals can also come in various different forms. So we have a list here of A to I, the different types of toxicity that we can get. The first one is acute toxicity. So this is typically, and this is what we already said, is the short-term immediate effects of a chemical and the toxicity of the chemical on, we're saying mammalians here, so mammals, so on us as well. So the LD50 is a typical measure of the lethal dose in 50% of the population of that the toxicity of that chemical. The next one is the LD, sorry, this should be the LE or the LC50 rather, the lethal concentration. So that's the ecotoxicity is the second one. It's how much of that pollutant or that chemical would go into, a, into the water to cause 50% of the fish to die. The third one, point C, chronic toxicity, we've also already mentioned. So this is not the short-term toxicity, it's the long-term toxicity. So this is the cancer carcinogenic, what is the cancer forming ability, what is the teratogenic, mutagenic type forms this, so what would happen to a fetus and what sort of um, mutations might there be for unborn children. The third type of toxicity, sorry, not third, the next type of toxicity is biological change. So what sort of biodegradability might there be? So sometimes you might hear this is a good thing, bioplastics might, might be biodegradable, we can biodegrade type various different things. This is not always a good thing if you've got waste that's being dumped out into nature. Biological changes and biodegradability can be, a, can be caused by the toxicity of chemicals. Okay. Abiotic changes, so these are things that are not biological, so the, we might have chemicals that react, so this could be oxidation or other forms of reaction to get some changes to the non-biological part of the environment. There are certain chemicals, the toxicity of certain chemicals can lead to bioaccumulation. So certain chemicals that are eaten, and the, the very good example of bioaccumulation is pesticides. So pesticides sprayed onto farmlands, the insects then get poisoned. Those insects get eaten by small birds or, bees, or yeah, birds, they get eaten by bigger birds, they might get eaten by other animals. And that chemical that was on the original insect that died starts adding up and building up into the food chain. So some of these chemicals can't be broken down as it goes up the food chain. So as the animals eat those toxins, it accumulates in them and can cause their death. Okay, this is not true of a lot of chemicals, but the pesticides got a very bad rap for this at one stage because that was the example that was always used and I'm using it as well. Okay, toxicity in the environment is, sorry, the toxicity is also determined by the mobility. So if we have a chemical that gets dropped onto the floor and it doesn't move anywhere, it's not going to be as serious as a toxin that lands on the floor and is able to spread due to its mobility. So if it's a liquid and it flows into the groundwater, it then moves through the different groundwater systems. The mobility and how it's able to move is also going to impact the environment and the toxicity of the chemical how can it spread through mobility? If we drop a single drop on the floor, that is not going to be as dangerous if we drop a whole bucket onto the floor. So the concentration and how much of this chemical we put into the environment is also going to be important. And last one is the assimilation capacity in the environment. So if you drop a toxin, it may be one drop, it may be a lot of drops, but if that toxin can break, or that chemical can break down, so if it breaks down fairly quickly and it becomes harmless due to chemical reactions or just natural degradation, it can react with air or something else and in 15 minutes time it's no longer there, it's not going to assimilate. So if it can assimilate and gather in the environment, it's going to be more toxic and have a higher impact on the environment. Okay, so coming back to the LD50. So we said D50 was the lethal dose that would result in 50% of the population dying. So this is where the human rights activists start getting concerned about how do we measure these sort of things. And the way that it's typically done is that it's done in something like mice. So LD50 would be a measure of the amount or the dose of a chemical needed to kill half of a group of test specimens, which would be, in this example, would be mice. So if we are testing a new chemical, a new drug, or just having to see is a pesticide, a herbicide, some sort of toxic chemical, how dangerous is it? It would be typically tested against a group of, let's just say, mice. So the lower the amount of toxin used, 
to get the LD50, the higher the toxic value of the chemical. So if you only need to use one gram of the stuff versus 100 gram, that means it is more toxic. It's fairly obvious, I think, on that one. So dioxins and PCBs have very low LD50s, so that means they're extremely dangerous to small animals or other test species. There is no way that we can now do this for humans. So what would typically happen here is that we have this example where the LD50 of a new pesticide is tested against a 20 gram mouse. That seems like a very small mouse, doesn't it? So the LD50 for a 20 gram mouse is found to be 0 0.043 milligrams for a new pesticide for a 20 kilogram mouse. Sorry, that's right. So what would be the LD50 dose, sorry, auto text, auto correct decides to change this to does. What is the LD50 dose, D-O-S-E, for a human assuming 70 kilograms as the average human? So what we need to see on this now, and I'd, let you, I'd like you to calculate this for us, is that 20 kilograms per, it's a 20 gram mouse needing 0 0.043 milligrams of a new herbicide. So it would be 0 0.043 milligrams divided by a 20 grams for the mouse. So it would be 0 0.043 milligrams per gram of mouse. We can then get that as 0 0.043 milligrams per kilogram of mouse. So you just convert that grams to kilograms. And that would be the LD50 for a mouse. We then assume that the LD50 for the mouse is going to be the same as the LD50 for a human. So once you've got the milligram per kilogram value, we multiply that by 70 kilograms for the average human, and that would be the lethal dose, the 50, LD50 dose for humans. How many milligrams would that then be? 70 kilograms is the typical number that's used in all literature on the average human weight, which is just, in my mind, it's possibly a little bit light, um, but I suppose it takes children into account as well. Okay. The rough guidelines for this is that if waste is toxic, if the LD50 is less than 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, so was the example above less than 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or if the lethal concentration, the LC50, is less than 2 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so that's a concentration versus a dose. The problem with this is that it is an acute calculation. So LD50 is if I drink this now, what will happen in the next hour, the next two hours, not the chronic, so what, not what's going to happen to me in six years time. The second problem is that a human is very different to a mouse. So the physiological aspects of a human is very different from a mouse. So a mouse is very small, we're very big, we have different diets, we have different, different everything. So is it actually the same? Okay. The other thing is that what happens if you have the synergistic? So what happens, sorry, I'm trying to think of the synonym for synergistic and I'm going blank now. What happens if we take this one pesticide as the example here, but we also have other chemicals that we are taking at the same time? So obviously we're not going to be taking chemicals or we're exposed to chemicals rather. We're not taking it. If we're exposed to these chemicals, what would happen if we take more than one of these chemicals at a time. We were exposed to them rather. So this LD50 doesn't take into account if you're taking all sorts of things all at once. Okay, it doesn't necessarily do that. So the LD50, as I've just said, is acute, but if you go and look on the website, you can get chronic toxicity as well. So let's just concentrate on the one on the left here for now. So as we said, there's risk associated with everything. So unfortunately, there's also an LD50 in everything. So if we look at this, we start at the top with the least dangerous things all the way up to the most dangerous things at the bottom. So even if you drink water, you'll see that you're allowed, you, will, you can kill yourself by drinking too much water. So too much water, it's nine, I'm just checking, it's 90,000. So it's 90, 90 grams per kilogram of body weight. So if you're 70 kilograms, 70 kilograms times by 90 grams, that's how much water you need to take in one sitting. So you need to drink all of that in one go. So no no waiting between it, that's all you need to take. So table sugar, monosodium glutamate, glutamate is food preservatives, even beer, alcoholic beverages rather, so that's ethanol. You'll see that there's actually a glyphosate, which is actually a herbicide, is actually is listed under the practically non-toxic. So even herbicides aren't going to hurt us. There are a couple of other things that are here. Slightly toxic, so I'd suggest you pause this to read through this properly. 
even slightly toxic are things that we are going to be having all the time. If you have too much vanillin, so it's from vanilla sugar or vanilla beans, that's quite a common thing, paracetamol, we're getting into some drug type things here, are slightly toxic but not too bad. Moderately toxic, we can now see we've got things like caffeine, which is coming up to be dangerous to us. Again, do the quick calculation, 190 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, multiply that by your body weight. How much caffeine would you really need to take? And caffeine, there's so little caffeine in a cup of coffee in terms of milligrams or micrograms, you'd have to have a, quite a lot of that. We do start getting into insecticides, rodenticides, there's copper sulfate and a couple of other things here. And then the highly toxic things are obviously the things that you are well aware of as toxins. So there's fungus and foot molds. There's one here that surprised me a bit was vitamin D3. So you have too much supplements, if you have too much fish or mushroom, so it's 37 milligrams per kilogram, how much do you need to have before you are going to fall in the LD50? So remember, the LD50 would mean that if, if you took that much, 37 milligrams per kilogram of your body weight of vitamin D3, you have a 50% chance of dying because that's only the LD50. 50% of the population would die if you had to have this all at once. So now is the time to go and look at your supplements and your tablets and see how much vitamin D3 is actually in it, and you'll see that it's minute amounts. So you don't have to be worried about any of these substances in your normal day-to-day -day living. So we've just said LD50 also, that's typically for acute toxicity, but I did find something, and you can see the link down here, it gives a whole article on it, on chronic toxicity. So chronic toxicity, and I can't recall um, what exactly this is, but the limits to this are all lower. So you'll see water is 90,000 versus 50,000. Sugar went from 3,000 down to 800. This one, from what I can work out, is the milligrams per kilogram if you keep a constant concentration in your body of these values. And it's going to be fairly difficult to have a constant concentration of this in your body all day, every day, day in and day out, before it has effects. Obviously, as you go down, these are things that you don't want in your body anyway, so we are going to avoid these things. The LD50, so we've got things that are safe. On the top of the green, we've got things that are slightly toxic, moderately toxic, and highly toxic. These LD50s are typically found on the material safety data sheet. So I think you've probably never come across a material safety data sheet because it's actually now called the safety data sheet. So a safety data sheet is the new name for an MSDS. It should only be referred to as an SDS these days. And things like the LD50 should be listed on, on the these forms somewhere towards the end from what I recall um, on most of these. Okay, so we also have the ecotoxicity. So the ecotoxicity I mentioned earlier was an LC50. So this is the lethal concentration that would result in, again, 50% of the population of, and this is just an example of fish dying if you had to pollute your rivers with your toxin. So if you've got some industrial site next to a river and there's a toxic spill for some or other reason, the LC50 would mean that 50% of whatever our test sample is would die from that chemical. So sorry about the quality of this. There is a link at the bottom. You can go and I try to zoom in rather than keep it too small. There is a link down here at the bottom. You can go and have a look at that DOI number. You can get the original table. So ecotoxicity is actually not as com is a little bit more complicated than the LD50 because it's now broken down into different types of organisms. So down the left-hand side is just a random list of pesticides that we have. So it's the fostrin. I don't, I've never come across any of these, I don't think. Omethoate, various other things. The next column is just the LD50. So we've got an LD50 comparison for a rat orally. So some of them are fairly low, so that would mean that they're highly toxic. So 0.02 millimoles is the LD50 for a rat, for that top one versus the bottom one. Asafate, I think it's called, is pronounced, is 5.73. For the LC50, so we've got LC50 now of C. leggins. So this is the type of microorganism, or it's an algae or something like that. And then we can see the numbers here. So depending on the type of chemical. We've got 1419, 1491, all the different values. So these LD, sorry, the LD50s versus the LC50s are slightly different. And maybe I'll jump to that now. So don't worry too much about the EC50s. Sorry, that's the ecotoxicity, which is the toxicity to 
the same thing. So that's also to see elegans. So that's the lethal concentration, that's the eco concentration, lethal ecotoxicity. I want to jump quickly right to the end. So you'll see the LD50 is ranked on the left from 1 to 10. So the most dangerous toxin is the one at the top versus the one at the bottom is the most toxic for a rat. But I'm not 100% sure what C. elegans is. On the LC50, the most dangerous one is somewhere down in the middle here. So what is dangerous for anim for, sorry, for rats is different to what is dangerous for other things. So some of the order is fairly, the same, fairly similar, but number one jumps all the way down to the bottom. Number six is about the same place, seven, eight. So that's pretty much the same order except for number one here, which is coming out. So the moral of the story what I want to just end with on this slide is that just because it's dangerous to a rat doesn't mean it's going to be, have the same toxicity in an aquatic situation for plants or algae or anything else. So the next step in this process is going to be the, do the, sorry, the dose response assessment. So at the dose response assessment stage, we have a whole bunch of calculations here. So we can, and I will possibly ask you calculation type questions in the TUT, and whatever I show you in the TUT are examples of what I can do in the exam. Okay, so as a reminder, this section is not in your test. Okay, so the first one is going to be a potency factor for carcinogens. So for carcinogens, that's the cancer forming materials. So this potency factor is equal to the incremental lifetime cancer risk. So if we have that chemical, what is the lifetime cancer risk divided by the chronic daily intake of that. The chronic daily intake is the CDI. So it's the average daily dose. Sorry, again, the autocorrect has changed that to does. The average daily dose, milligrams per day, per body weight in kilograms. And I see my brackets are coming off there as well. Okay, so the potency factor would then be incremental lifetime cancer risk divided by the CDI, so it's divided by the average daily dose over the body weight. That would give us the potency factor. If the contaminant is drinking water, so the CDI can be expressed as a concentration in milligrams per liter multiplied by the intake rate, multiplied by the exposure, all the units being here, divided by body weight, which is in kilograms, multiplied by 70. So it's, that's why I was getting confused by the 70 earlier as well. So the 70 is the average body weight of the human, and 70 is the average lifespan that is used in all these calculations as well. So it's actually quite easy to remember. 70 kilograms, 70 years per life. In this calculation, though, you use your own body weight, multiplied by 365, and that's just to get the units crossed out as they needed to. If the exposure route, so it's no, not being taken in orally by drinking water, it's taken in by inhalation, so it's by gases. The CDI then just simply converts to, instead of milligrams per liter, we become milligrams per cubic meter. So you'll see the liter number just becomes cubic meters. Otherwise, it's the same as the equation above. The last equation on this dose response assessment is the hazard quotient. So the hazard quotient is the average daily dose during the exposure period, so it'll be milligrams per kilogram per day, divided by the RFD, which is the reference dose. And the reference dose will always be given in the calculations if you see them in a TUT or in an exam. So what this will lead to is a dose response curve. With the dose response curve along the x-axis is the concentration of the drug. So we talk about the drug here because this is appro appropriate both to good drugs, so things that you will take for headaches or anything else like that that the doctor prescribes, so this is a pharmacological type calculation, or something that is going to be toxic and have some sort of effect to you. It is, in, is almost always given in a log scale. So from the left, we start at 0 0.01 all the way up to 1,000. In this example, sorry, and then on the y-axis, is the response. So it's as a percentage of the maximum. Okay, so this could either be the response, sorry, could either be the maximum effect, could be a maximum death rate because of some toxic. This could also quite easily also represent the maximum effectiveness of something like COVID. Okay, so what sort of concentration would I need to give different persons in the population so that they have the maximum effect or the maximum protection against COVID, so COVID drug, for example. So this graph actually comes from a pharmacy website where they talk about drugs in terms of medicines. Okay, 
This point at the bottom here, so in this graph, this red line starts at the very left-hand side. So what it's saying is that the minimum dose is where something takes effect. So where does it actually leave the 0%? Where are you starting to get some sort of response? That would be the minimum dose. Most things will not start at zero. You need to actually give more than 0% of a chemical or a medicine to a person before it becomes effective. When we get here, so the slope, we don't need to worry about the slope, but the potency of this, so this would be the, this would be the LD50, the ecological, um, the ecotoxicity. At this point here, we can now see, or we can read off this graph rather, the other way around. 50% is where it hits there, so the LD50 of this drug would be at about one. Okay, so this is the dose response curve. Almost all of them follow a type of S shape on a semi-logarithmic curve on the x-axis. What we also need to understand is the human exposure assessment. Risk is going to have two components. Firstly, it's the toxicity of the, it's the, uh, the, toxicity of the substance. So how toxic is the substance and what is the amount of exposure? So it may have a large toxicity, but we're not exposed to it for too long, or the other way, or vice versa. Okay. And if nobody is ever exposed, there is no human risk. So we're only looking at the human exposure here, not the environmental exposure. So if nobody's going to be exposed, there actually is no risk. In terms of human exposure assessment, it's going to be carried out into two parts. Firstly, it's the pathways that are going to allow the agents to be transformed from the source to the point of contact. So where, how is this toxic, toxin, toxic chemical rather going from where it's coming, sorry, from the source to meeting people? How is that pathway actually followed? And then we need to look at an assessment on the amount of contact that is likely to occur between people and these contaminants. So if it is a gas particle or it's a gaseous emission, is the wind blowing it away from the people? Is it blowing it towards the people? What is the likelihood of the contact to occur? So here's a very basic site conceptual model on an exposure pathway. So what this says is that we've got an exposure point down on this side here. So let's just say there's some person here who has some barrels that he's got on the left here with some toxic source. So that's the source and there's a spill. So when there's the spill, there are various routes that this could take to get to people. The first one is obviously the arrows at the top. So these are chemical spill and this might be a highly volatile organic which then vaporizes, so there's the volatilization. Once it's in the air, the wind can then just simply blow it to wherever it needs to be. At some point, it's going to either drop or it's going to come into contact with people. So if it's going to come into contact with people, we are now breathing it in. So what is that pathway? The second way is through soil in this diagram. I'm just trying to see how. So this oil, well, this chemical rather, could spill into the oil. Oh. Oil could go into the soil. Sorry, that rhymes too much. Once it's in the soil, it can either just move naturally. There might be some water that might be part of the soil that could then eventually just, or there could be a slope. This might be a higher land. It might go down and down. Once it's here, we could get it into our homes. It could come through paint. It could come through, I don't know, sorry, exposure, not paint, exposure, point. I'm reading things wrong here. And we could then either breathe it in again, or we might touch something and we could ingest it through our mouths. Okay. This oil could go further down. So it might not go just into the soil. It might go all the way down into the water. So if it goes down into the groundwater, it could then also be carried through the groundwater. Once it's in the groundwater, we could then have water, a well coming up. And again, it could come through our water and we could drink it. So there's again, some sort of ingestion taking here. So the medium here, the environmental medium is groundwater. The environmental medium on the top one is water, whereas the middle one is soil. What isn't shown here, which is also the same, it could go into a river. So a river could do exactly the same thing as the groundwater, and we could have water taking it across to where it needs to go. So these sort of pathways need to be monitored. And how can we prevent, if we do have a spill, how can we prevent it coming through here? So typically what would happen is at a place like a petrol station or at some other large facility, you would often have well points. So you would drill a well some point far away or 
medium term, a medium distance, and then a little bit further away, you would drill down and then take samples of the water or soil samples to analyze, have you got a leak? So when you've got a tanker underground at a petrol station, you're not going to know if it's going to, if it's actually leaking unless you monitor it so that you've got some monitoring wells on that. This link at the bottom here takes you to a whole textbook basically of, of what's happening here. So if you want to go and have a read, it's worth a, a quick stop by to see what's going on in the, the diagram and above and below it. What we also want to look at, or the final thing that we're looking at today, is risk characterization. And this is the final step in the risk assessment. So what we are going to be looking at is what are the uncertainties of here, which dose response assessment, exposure assessment should be used, so how are we actually going to look at this, which population groups should be the primary targets for protection, and what provides the most meaningful expression of the risk. So risk characterization is written here as the last step in the process, but it can typically be something that is considered the whole way along the risk chain. So the final step here, though, would be to make sure that everything that you've looked at is covered correctly and that you have some response to what you are going, that, well, sorry, some response to the pollutant that you might be putting out into the environment. As I said, this section is also in the textbook. So I think this is chapter four from, if I recall correctly. So from page 127 to 166, you can find the section in the textbook. I will be using this textbook again for the TUT. So please look out for two, hopefully two versions of the TUT. So there'll be the one just with the numbers, then I'll fill, fill out all the details probably later this week. So you might only see those coming up on Thursday or Friday, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks for that, and then don't forget next week, we do have our test.